Well, good morning, Heartland Church. How you guys doing this morning? Man, it's great to be here with you guys. I, I was literally standing over there worshiping and, and just looking around the room and just thinking to myself, what a blessing it is to be a part of this church, to be a part of, a part of God's house. Like looking at you guys, y'all are the best church in the world and we have the best pastors in the world, don't we? Pastor Dusty and Kendra, man, we love them so much. And uh, before we do anything else here for just a second, can I just look into the camera and welcome all of those people that are tuning in online. We're so glad that you're with us today. Come on, church, let's give it up for them. Thanks for tuning in today. So Reveal Conference is coming up quick. It's coming up quick. And as the next gen pastor, I would be remiss if I did not uh, talk about it for just a second. And I won't, I'll be very brief because there's been a very handsome fella on video talking to you guys about it in previous weeks. So um, I just want to mention to you that Reveal Conference is the best thing that we do for our Heartland students all year long, okay? And if you will just allow me to, as the next gen pastor, if you have a teenager who's in sixth grade through 12th grade, they need to be at this conference, okay? It is a non-negotiable, they got to be here, okay? They got to be here. Now, I realize life gets busy, things get in the way, I understand that. In fact, we have a couple of students that have games or dances or whatever it is on Friday night, and so they're not coming Friday night, but they're coming the rest of the weekend, okay? So whatever it is, whatever hurdle we have to jump over, whatever hoop we have to jump through, we want to do it for your teenagers, okay? Whatever it is we got to do, we'll do it. Also, the last thing I'll say about Reveal Conference is this. Please, please, please do not let be finances, do not let finances be a reason that your student doesn't come to Reveal, okay? We have an incredible church, just like I was talking about. I've had several members come up to me and say they want to sponsor some students for Reveal Conference, so we have it, okay? We want to bless you. Please do not let uh, finances be a reason that your student does not come. We will take care of you, all right? Can I get a good amen? Amen. 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 All right. Well, today, uh, I wanted to tell you guys that Carly and I, my wife, we just recently had a pretty big milestone happen for us, and... Uh, Pastor Dusty thought it would be pretty cool if, if I brought our new son, Brady, onto the stage. And so, <laughs> I just want to introduce you guys. This is, uh, this right here is Brady Michael Faulkner. Here, let me, let me turn him around for you. There we go. Are the lights too bright, bub? Well, we'll get you up here very, soon enough. He's very tired. We'll get you up here. But <laughs> look at him, he's just nodding off. <laughs> Funny story, we actually had a different outfit on him first service. <laughs> babies gonna be babies, am I right? They, he pooped through it, so we have a new one. <laughs> well, and I, in sleep deprivation, grabbed a shirt, did not bring other pants. Hey, it's okay. So, it is okay. lesson learned, it. I probably know that, but I'll do it better <laughs> next time. See, he's already out. So Brady is eight <laughs> weeks old. He's eight weeks old. Uh, he's starting to like smile and laugh a little bit, which is really, really fun. He's less like a potato and more like a person, right? <laughs> So that's great. And uh, he's big moving milestone. all the time, constantly moving. Recently discovered he has hands. Yep. So we have just so much going on in our house. It's so much fun. So what's really great, a big milestone happened for us this past week. We got seven straight hours of uninterrupted sleep, everybody. <laughs> Pretty incredible. So, so that's Brady. Just wanted to introduce him to you. I love you, son. Have a great service, all right? I'm a little upset that you're sleeping through my message, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll forgive you. Uh, <laughs> now, for those of you that don't know, it's actually a pretty big deal that Brady is with us today. Um, Carly and I had a lot of difficulties getting pregnant, and uh, the short story version of this is that um, we had doctors tell us that if we didn't do IVF, no matter what we did, if it wasn't IVF, we would have a less than 5% chance of getting pregnant. And uh, I'm here today to say that our God is a good God, a faithful God, because that's our less than 5% chance right there, everybody. And so uh, it, it's pretty great. Now, what I'll tell you is that it is so much better, and anybody who's been through a season like this in their life can attest, but it's so much better, so much more wonderful to be on this side of that storm in our life. It, it's so much more exciting. It's so much more fun. To, to know that finally we've received what God has promised us. But I would venture to say that there are people in the room right now who maybe you're still in the fight of your life, that you're still going through that storm, 
that you have a, a fresh wound in a relationship or you have a business that's taking you away from your family and it's stressing you out. Maybe you're looking for that perfect job that checks every box and you're just not finding it. Can I tell you that there are people in this room right now that are going through storms in their life? And if that's you, I want to tell you that this message today is for you. If you've ever felt like your world is falling apart and the pressure is just too much to bear and you wonder, God, where are you? If you've, if you've ever felt like that, then you're going you're gonna to be able to, to sympathize with our story today. It's the story of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1 through chapter 4 is what we're going to be reading today. It's, it's such a powerful story about how God turns our bitterness and our brokenness into an incredible blessing. And that's my hope and my prayer for us today, that maybe some of you are feeling bitter towards God. I'm believing that after today you will leave encouraged and be back on the road to blessing, uh, uh, being a blessing and, and being blessed by our God. Amen? Amen. So let's take a look at this story this morning. It's Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. It's right there in your notes. It says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country Moab. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah, who was the great, 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 great grandmother of Oprah. And, uh, <laughs> just kidding, that's a bad joke. Uh, and the other named Ruth. After they lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. So let's come, let's come back to the text here in just a second. Let's take a pause, because I just want to make sure that you understand the context in which this was written. This was written during the era where Israel didn't have a king. They were ruled by judges, and for about 350 years, it was complete chaos. Famine in the land, things were not going the way that they thought it should be going. And so when we review what we just read in the text, we see that Elimelech and Naomi are, are, are filled with famine. They, they, there's famine in the land, and so they decide to leave the place of God's blessing in Bethlehem and travel to the enemy country of Moab. Come on, there, there's a lesson there for somebody. Let's not leave the place of God's blessing. And so they leave the place of God's blessing in Bethlehem, and they travel to an enemy territory known as Moab, and it ends up costing them in more ways than you can imagine. The Bible says that Naomi's life fell apart. She lost her husband, and if you're anything like me, you, you think, well, at least she had her sons. You know, it's terrible that her spouse has died, but at least she has her boys who will grow up and, and, and marry uh, women and, and they'll have their children and, and at least Naomi will have a family, right? But then her two sons die. And so now she is left by herself with her two daughters-in-law and she even tells her daughters-in-law, hey, you guys should leave. Don't, don't come back with me. I have nothing to offer you. Go back to your homeland where you can remarry and have a good life. But then Ruth, the main character in this story, says, no way, I'm sticking with you. And what's so cool, it's, it's one of the, the coolest verses in the Bible. In fact, a lot of people use this in their marriage vows, which is funny to me because it's not a spouse saying this to a spouse, it's a daughter-in-law saying it to her mother-in-law. But she says, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. And so completely broken, and devastated, Naomi leaves the country of Moab to go back to Bethlehem with Ruth. And the scripture tells us in verse 19, it says, When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Now, this was not a good, can this be Naomi? It wasn't like they were looking at her saying, Dang, girl, you're looking good, Naomi. It wasn't like that. It was like, oh my goodness. Is this the same Naomi that left Bethlehem 10 years ago? I mean, her life looks like it has completely fallen apart. She, she looks terrible. And in possibly one of the most heartbreaking scriptures in the Bible, in my opinion, Naomi says this to these women. She says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Now I'm guessing that there may be a few of us in the room today that can relate to this in your life. That you're wondering, how did I end up here? 
Maybe you hoped and dreamed about a life filled with fulfillment and ministry, and yet time and time again, you come to a roadblock. You come to a frustrating point in your life. You say, God, I put my trust in you. I did what I felt like you were calling me to do. I, I went to church. I was a good person. I, I gave in the offering. I trusted you. I believed in you. I tried to follow you. I went out full, and now I've come back empty, God, and I believe that that's on you. Here I am today, feeling hopeless and alone. Now, church, there's two big ideas that I want to pull from this scripture, and here's the first one. It's that the wrong direction always leads to the wrong destination, okay? The wrong direction always leads to the wrong destination. Anytime that you're going in the wrong direction, you will never end up where you want to be. For example, if my destination is you right in front of me, but I turn around and I start walking towards this screen right here, can I tell you that I'm never going to get to my desired destination because I'm moving in the wrong direction, and some of us here today feel like this because we're trying to do everything we can to get to God, and yet we're moving in the opposite direction of God. And it leaves us feeling empty and hopeless, wondering, God, where are you? I was supposed to live a life filled with fulfillment. Why am I not living this life? Why have you forsaken me and left me? But the truth is, church, God didn't leave you. You're just moving in the wrong direction. So let's make sure that we're moving in the right direction. So this is what Naomi was doing. Her trajectory was away from God, away from where she was called. She was blessed in Bethlehem, and yet she moved to Moab, enemy territory. In fact, it's hard to describe to you how much the Lord despised Moab. In, in fact, in, in Psalm 60, I believe it is, it says that Moab was God's wash basin. He washed, it, he washed his feet in Moab. That's how much he despised it. Now, how many of you guys in the room today, you would say that there's a city or a town that you've been to before that you just didn't really like that much, right? Like, how many of you guys are out there? Like, there's just something about the city. You don't, can't quite put your finger on it, but you just don't like it. You know what I'm saying? There's just something about it. And, and what's really funny is that in, in the original Greek, Moab is actually translated to Houston, if you can believe it or not. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's not true. <laughs> That's not true. That was just for, my, just for my buddy Cody over here. I love you, Cody. He's from Houston. I love you so much. We love Houston. There's great people from Houston, great churches in Houston. We love Houston. We just don't like the Astros, Rockets, or Texans. And God's people said amen. I will not say amen. So church, I would ask you this today. Is your life pointed in the direction of God? I want you to take a moment, and I just want you to think about your daily life, what you do in a day. Are those things pointed towards God? Does your heart, does your mind drift toward things that are eternal and God-honoring? And my guess is that there are some of you here today that would say, you know what, Mikey, I think at one point in my life, the answer would be yes. That, that at one point in my life, like I remember that first time feeling with Jesus. I remember just being so overwhelmed by his grace and his grandeur. And, and it was so incredible because I would go to sleep at night thinking about Jesus. I would wake up first thing in the morning thinking about Jesus. I would go about my life trying to be a blessing to other people. But somewhere along the way, I just got distracted. And it didn't happen in just a moment, it wasn't just a, a decision that I made, but over time, little by little, I just stopped leaning on God and I got distracted. And I just want you to hear me say this to you today, church, that I believe that there is a favor and a blessing and an anointing that comes with living a God-centered life, but you can't live a God-centered life if God isn't the center of your life. I know it's mind-blowing, right? But I want you to be able to live a God-centered life. I want you to put him first in your life because I believe that it comes with blessing and favor and anointing in your world. The second thing that we learn from this story is that a distorted view of God always leads to a distorted view of life. Now, I have a confession to make today, everyone. And uh, before you and the Lord, I have to confess it today. 
I had a distorted view of what it was going to be like to be the parent of a newborn. I really did. I really did. In fact, you guys uh, in this church, there was a lot of you that would come up to me and you would say, Mikey, hey, you better make sure you're getting some sleep. That was the one piece of advice everyone gave us. Hey, you better make sure you're sleeping, buddy. (laughs) You better make sure you're sleeping because guess what? You're never going to sleep again. (laughs) And like I can see the pain in your eyes as you're telling me this because you're living through it right now, right? But, but that's, the, that's the advice that everyone would give me is sleep while you can, sleep while you can. And I remember thinking to myself in that moment, surely, surely it cannot be that bad. Surely it cannot be that bad. I understand you got to feed them every so often. We'll figure it out. It can't be that bad. Church, can I tell you, it's that bad. It's that bad. In fact, I got my wife's permission to tell this story to you today. See, Brady, <laughs> oh my goodness. Brady was supposed to be born on Wednesday, January 5th. Okay, that was his original due date. Well, when he didn't come on the 5th, the doctor told us to come into the hospital Thursday night, the 6th, and they were gonna get the process started, and so we get in there, we get hooked hooked up to all the monitors, I get to see all the equipment for the first time, which is really cool, and so like I'm like a kid in a candy shop, just walking around touching everything, I'm really excited. But then the nurse walks up to me and she said, all right, Dad, this is where you'll be sleeping tonight. And I look over, And it's like this plastic chair from hell, everybody, is what it is. It's like sleeping on plastic nails all night long. But you know what? I I told myself, I was like, Mikey, this isn't that big of a deal. Your wife is the true superstar here, okay? If she can go through what she's going through, you can be inconvenienced for a night, right? And all the ladies said, amen. So, So that's what I was telling myself. I was like, Mikey, it's not about you anyway, bro. Chill. Who cares if you're inconvenienced for a night? Well, that night I got zero hours of sleep, but guess what? It didn't matter because I woke up the next day. I shouldn't say woke up because I never went to sleep, but I got up the next day and I said, I said to myself today, my son's going to be born. So I don't care if I got zero hours of sleep. It doesn't matter. I woke up with a, with a vigor, everybody. Like I was energized. I was excited. The adrenaline was flowing. I was ready. Well, then hours go by. And the adrenaline starts to fade a little bit. And it gets to be 7 p.m. and there's no baby. And so the nurse walks in and she says, hey, guys, you, uh, you should go ahead and start getting settled in for the night. And I said, settled in for the night, you say. And I looked at my plastic chair from hell. <laughs> and a shudder went through my spine. <laughs> I was thinking to myself, would the linoleum floor be more comfortable than this chair? But so we, we, we kind of hang out for a couple more hours, and around 11 p.m., we finally decide to start going to sleep. And, y'all, I was right there on the cusp of sleep. Y'all know, y'all know that feeling? When you're right there, you're almost asleep, but then you're just, you're not quite there. I was right there on the cusp of sleep, and boom, a nurse walks in, and she's like, it's game time. Are you ready? It's time to go. It's time to start pushing. And we're like, oh, oh okay. And I jump out of the chair and, I, and I'm, the adrenaline's flowing again. And we're super excited and I'm hyped and I'm being the best coach that I can be. And at 12, 17 a.m. on Saturday, January 8th, our son is born. And it's the most incredible moment of our lives, right? But then once again, <laughs> the adrenaline starts to fade away. Over the next several hours, you guys that have kids, you know, Like, it's not just you have the baby and then you get to go to sleep. No, no, no. You have the baby and then there's tests to run. You got to check mom. You got to check baby. You got to make sure everything is okay. So hours go by and finally around 4 a.m. we get to our postpartum room, which somehow everything is smaller in that room. I don't understand. But it doesn't matter. At that point, I've been awake for 42 hours. I could have slept in a beanbag chair. I didn't care. So I get to that point. Y'all know the tired, the tiredness you feel? when you can hit the pillow and just, you're gone. You know that feeling? That's what happened to me. I hit that pillow and I was out, gone. But then five minutes later, (laughs) this is not hyperbole. This is not exaggeration. This is legit five minutes after I fall asleep. You know what I hear? (laughs) From that kid over there. And I wake up, y'all, and I'm not, I'm not even joking. Like, I wake up, and I'm like, what have we done? <laughs> what did we do, Carly? 
I'm like, we're never going to sleep again. This is the end. This is how I die. I'm nauseous. I'm shaking. I've got a headache. I didn't even care about Carly anymore at this point. I'm like, what is happening? (laughs) Praise God, we've not had a moment like that since. But can I tell you, in the beginning, I had a distorted view of what it was going to be like to have a newborn. I did. And can I just tell you, church, that a distorted view of God always leads to a distorted view of life. And we see this in Naomi's case as well, because she was away from the things of God, and because she was away from the things of God, it distorted how she saw God. And because it distorted how she saw God, it distorted how she saw her life. And that brought her to the conclusion that, you know what? God made my life bitter. God made my life bitter. It's all God's fault. He's, he's let me down, and God didn't do what he should have done, and Maybe that's where some of us are here in the room today, that we find ourselves bitter at the things of God. You've got a distorted view of God, and it's, it's distorting your view of life, and you're wondering, why did he let you down? And without even realizing it, you wake up one day, and you're just bitter. See, last year around this time, uh, we just had our, our, our Reveal Conference prayer meeting with our leadership team, about 30 leaders. It was great, an incredible night. And uh, last year around this time, I was actually writing the prayer message that I was looking through this year, and I was bitter. I was bitter because I was writing a prayer message for, about a God that wasn't coming through for me in my moment. Does that make sense? And so what ended up happening is this year, I was looking through my notes, and I found this sentence in my notes from last year. It says, have you ever prayed for something and it didn't happen. Are you currently in a season like that right now? Because Carly and I definitely are. And I remember typing that on my computer last year and being so toxic, being so bitter to the things of God. In fact, I felt my, myself just being like Naomi. Don't call me Mikey, call me Mara, because I'm bitter. Naomi left the blessing of God and then blamed God when things took a turn for a worse. And then here's the worst part. She stayed there for a decade. For 10 years, she stayed in that bitterness. I feel like this is a word for somebody this morning is that I believe that right now, God, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. And he's saying, hey, don't be bitter any longer. Don't let it take 10 years to come back. Don't, don't, don't let it take 10 years for you to go from Moab back to Bethlehem. Let's turn and make a decision today, not tomorrow, not next month, not next year, but today to stop the bitterness. How do we do that? Well, we do exactly what Naomi did. See, her roots were still with God, and she called God a very specific name. I I want you to think about this for just a second. The way that you view God affects the way and the name that you call him, right? Like, if, if I hear somebody say, oh, that's God. He's just the big guy in the sky, the man in the clouds. If I heard somebody say that, I'd be like, you know, I don't really feel like they have that great of a relationship with God. Because once you've experienced the the nature of God, the, the redeeming qualities of Jesus, come on, once you're transformed by him, once you've tasted and seen the goodness of God, once you've been forgiven by God in so many different ways, once you see his sovereignty, come on, you don't call him the big guy in the sky, you talk about him like he's my savior, he's my redeemer, he is the king of kings, he is the prince of peace. He is my comforter. He is my redeemer. Come on and give a better praise this morning, somebody. That's the type of God that we serve. That's the name that we give our God. Tell him who he is. When you know God, you call him by those kinds of names. You call him by intimate names. And what Naomi does is she reveals her pain in the midst of a little bit of faith. Look at what she says. She says, call me Mara. Why? Because the Almighty, the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Now, the Hebrew name for God that's translated as Almighty is El Shaddai. Everybody say El Shaddai. Shaddai. Now, another translation for El Shaddai is the all-sufficient one, that no matter what I'm going through, no matter the frustration in my life, El Shaddai, he is sufficient for me. He is all that I need. 
A practical translation there in your notes is that God is exactly what you need when you need him. He is El Shaddai. He is ample. He is sufficient. He is enough. Whatever you need in this moment, El Shaddai can take care of you. Now, what's so powerful in Naomi's story is to watch God work in her life, to watch her story unfold. Naomi is broken. Naomi is confused. Naomi doesn't know where God is. She tells her daughters-in-law, go back home because I've got nothing for you. Please. And yet Ruth sticks with her. And God blesses Ruth through that. Because what happened is that God brought Ruth her Boaz. Boaz was a, a handsome man, a rich man, and a godly man. And can I just tell you, all the single ladies in the room, if you see a rich man, a godly man, and a handsome man, that equals a husband. All right, everybody? <laughs> that, that, that's what we're doing here, okay? And, and don't settle for anything less than your Boaz, because God's got him for you, all right? Here's what I don't want you to miss. In Ruth chapter 4, you watch as God blesses this very special relationship out of Naomi's brokenness through now her lineage by marriage. We see this in chapter 4, verse 13. It says, so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life, sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. And the women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of David. You see, through Naomi's lineage, we got Obed. Through Obed's lineage, we got King David. And through King David's lineage, we got our Savior Jesus. Can I tell you today, church? Can I tell you today, church? God can take any brokenness, any bitterness, and turn it into an unbelievable blessing in your life. Thank you, Jesus. In your brokenness today, in your bitterness today, can I just tell you that our God is bringing you exactly what you need. He is El Shaddai, all sufficient. It's his love for you, it's his power for you, his goodness to give you hope in the midst of your pain. And if I'm being honest, this is exactly what God did for Carly and I in the midst of the biggest storm of our life. We feel like we've come on, on this side of the storm battle-scarred a little bit. A few life lessons that God has given us. For example, God allowed us to not only grow closer to him through that season of our life, but he also allowed us to grow closer to each other. I've never loved my wife more than I do today. And, and I believe that that season allowed us to grow closer together. Fighting those fights, going through those battles together made us closer can I tell you that, that that storm, that season for us, let us lead a life that relied less on our own talents and abilities, and it allowed us to rely more on the giftings from God, his anointing and his power. It's allowed us to minister to this church from a place of humility. It gave us a message about a silly little sticky note that has gone on to bless so many different people. It gave us a message about a sticky note where you, you, you put your prayer request on that sticky note and you circle it every time you pray for it, believing that God can do a miracle in your life. Can I tell you that it hasn't even been a year since we got pregnant with Brady, and that story has been preached to hundreds of people in multiple venues. We, we've preached it here at this church. We, we talked about it at Now Camp last year where we had hundreds of students come to the altar, create their own sticky note, and circle it for the first time, believing that God is going to do something in their life. I've received so many texts and social media messages from people in this church and other churches, kids at Now Camp, saying, Mikey, look at what God did in my life. And can I just tell you that every time I see one of those sticky notes, it reminds me of the time that we spent begging and pleading in our bitterness, asking God to give us our son. 
And every time I see his face, it's a reminder of the faithfulness of our God. Because God can take bitterness and turn it into a blessing, y'all. He can. Don't stay in Moab when God's calling you to Bethlehem. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes all across the room today? In our weakness, Carly and I had a psalm that we read over and over and over again. It's a psalm from David. It's Psalm 13, and it's just six short verses. And it's a psalm that just ministered to us in our time of bitterness and brokenness. The first four verses are spoken from a point of view of David when he's going through one of his biggest storms of his life. And it's four verses that that talk about, God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? Where are you? I can't see you. I can't find you. But then I want to read to you what verses 5 and 6 say. So here for just a second, I just want you to close your eyes, bow your heads, and I want to read you these six verses. And I just want you, especially those who feel like they're in the midst of their own storm today, I want you, when I'm reading this, to feel as though you are saying these things to God today. Verse 1, it says, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long? Will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say I have overcome him and all of my foes will rejoice when I fall. But then we get to verses five and six that say, but God, I trust in your unfailing love. Come on, say that right where you're at. God, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. With every head bowed, every eye closed, can I just tell you today, church, the Lord has been good to you. Don't let your brokenness and your bitterness cloud your judgment towards God. Don't don't let a distracted view of God lead to a distracted view of life. I'm asking that you would stop running from God today and instead Embrace him like you never have before. So with every eye closed today, I I just want to know who I'm talking to. Maybe you're in the midst of your own storm, the the biggest battle you've ever been a part of. Maybe maybe it's a small storm, but come on, y'all all all know, it doesn't matter the size of the storm, it still stinks while you're going through it. Maybe you're going through a storm today, maybe you're bitter today, maybe you're broken today. I just want you to know that God is here for you. And so on the count of three, would you just let me know if I'm talking to you right now that you're in the middle of a storm or maybe you've turned from God and you're, you're kind of going the wrong way and you want to turn back to the right way. If that's you on the count of three, would you just raise your hand? One, two, three. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Would you just pray this today in your own way? Heavenly Father, oh, Lord, Meet us here today in our brokenness. Meet us today, God, in our bitterness. I don't know when it happened, God, but something, whether it was an unanswered prayer request or whether it was something that happened in my life, I I just stopped trusting and believing in you. But Lord, today I turn back to El Shaddai. I turn back to my redeemer. I turn back to my comforter. I turn back to my savior. Thank you, Jesus, that while I was still a sinner, you sent your son to die for me. And Lord, today I 
I stop running and I turn around to your warm embrace. I love you so much, Jesus. Thank you for being the Lord of my life. I ask you into my heart today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Come on, can we clap our hands for the, what the Lord has done today in this service? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Church, I just want you to know that we have an incredible team here of pastors and leaders that, that we want to hear your story, okay? I had several people come up to me after the first service. Uh, a couple came up to me and told me, you know, Pastor Mikey, I, I got to tell you, we had our own struggles with infertility. It, it, it made us broken and bitter, and we were so frustrated. And they told me, they were like, we started coming back to church, like, to get closer to God because we wanted to be closer to him going through all of this. And today, that was back in November, today, they are 13 weeks pregnant. It's incredible what God is doing. And so we, we want to hear your story. We want to help you through this. Don't, don't do life alone. Don't go through life alone. Let us help you. Let us pray for you. Our staff will be out in the lobby, and we just want to hear from you, okay? Whatever it is that you need, we want to help take care of you. Would you just stand all over the room as, as we're about to dismiss this morning? I hope that this message touched you today. And uh, before we leave, I just want to tell you, these cards that are in your seat, just like Cody talked about a little bit earlier, you can take those cards and drop them in the boxes as you leave today. That's how you can turn them in. And, and I just thank you so much, Heartland Church Partners, for remembering your church and your giving. If you're a guest here today, please feel no obligation to give. This service is our gift to you. Uh, but if you do want to give, you can do it at theheartlandchurch.com slash give, or you can drop your gift in the black boxes as you leave through the tunnels today. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Can I pray for you one more time as we leave and our worship team is gonna dismiss y'all, all right? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords, El Shaddai. We love you, Lord Jesus. I pray that this message has touched somebody, that right now the Holy Spirit is moving in our life about this word, Lord God. And for everything that is given today, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would use it for the expansion of your kingdom. Lord God, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. I love you, Heartland Church. You guys are dismissed. I hope you have an incredible rest of your Sunday. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. Never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle work, promise keep.
Sometimes sorrow is the door to peace. Sometimes heartache is the gift I need. Your faithful, faithful in all things. It is. The Lord is my shepherd, leads me to still waters, and he restores my soul. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 